renowned criminal defense attorney, Neil Rockheim. What does killer cross-examination actually mean? Look, there are so many different styles of cross-examination. There are so many different ways that lawyers go about attempting to cross-examine witnesses. Some like to stand on top of the desk, well, not literally, but sort of figuratively and stand on top of the desk and want to yell and scream and throw pens. And I even knew some guys back in the day that would keep a pocket protector and a little bag of, of highlighters and pens, and they would throw them across the room as, um, uh, at witnesses who would um, come to, would be testifying. Every time they were upset or disappointed with an answer, they would take another pen or another object on their desk, and they would throw it across the desk and throw it across the, the, the table. And it was almost comical because it was so ineffective. Then there are another type, another group of lawyers that would do these types of cross-examinations that were the opposite of killer cross-examinations. They were, they were almost appeasing cross-examinations. They were like Neville Chamberlain and appeasement to uh, an enemy and uh, believing that all you had to do was just get up there and be the nice guy and just essentially repeat what the witnesses testified to on direct. And I can recall witnesses back when, lawyers back when I was a a prosecutor, and even some lawyers who ended up in the same cases as me on the defense side, where I represented one person and they represented another, and these lawyers would get up there and they would would do these cross-examinations that were anything but no leading questions, no probing questions, no, no insight, no strategy. What they would literally do is almost repeat word for word, question for question, fact for fact, what the prosecutor had established with the witness on direct examination. It was like having two prosecutors in the courtroom. It was terrible, absolutely terrible. In fact, there were times when we've had co-defendants where we sat down, we had two, three, four, five, six defendants in the case, and we're looking, and I or, or one of my contemporaries who I trusted, we would look and we would say, if these lawyers have to go first, because if we go first and establish some, some important information, we challenge the credibility, we undermine the believability, we attack the, the state's case, we begin to kill the state's case, that these lawyers will get up there and undo it. So where did um, killer cross-examination come from? And I'm going to tell you a story about how it all began. Um, I'm going to take you back to uh, my very first trial, my first trial as a young prosecutor. So I want you to imagine, here I am, a a young prosecutor. I had a very nice, well-fit pinstripe suit and a white shirt and a cool blue tie. And I worked for this uh, prosecutor's office who was known for um, a very tough, no plea bargaining stance. We didn't plea bargain any cases, in fact, when one of the, or very few cases, in fact, when one of the uh, higher-ups had a big meeting, administrators had a meeting with all of us lawyers in a a meeting room, one of them said, we want, later in my career, we want you to, to use discretion in deciding how to handle cases, and one of our peers turned to us and said, discretion, I don't want any part of that, because we were so used to just getting the cases, preparing them for trial, lining them up and trying them. There was so little discretion in terms of plea bargaining that we just tried cases. So we cut our teeth. We learned how to try cases as prosecutors. We tried so many of them. One of the very um, later in my career, I'm sort of skipping ahead, but later in my career, I happened to meet famed legendary lawyer Jerry Spence, who represented Imel DeMarcos, Randy Weaver, Karen Silkwood, um, and of course was lead counsel in, um, um, in so many, so many huge cases. Uh, actually was lead counsel um, in the federal case involving Jeffrey Figer. Um, and, and Jerry was, uh, I, I met him, and I actually met him at a, at a weekend event, and I had read a book of his in which he had shared that he was a prosecutor. 
he had prosecuted a case, and I told him that I too was a prosecutor at one point, and he said, well, son, you'll have to make penance for that. And I laughed. So my first trial was as a prosecutor many, many years ago. And so here's the the case involved, and this is where sort of my killer cross-examination, my approach to cross-examination was born. It was born out of the idea that I understood what the truth was, and that regardless of what the witness was going to say to me, that I could outsmart, outwit, that I could use humor, um, logic, and that ultimately the story that I told on cross-examination through my questioning of witnesses was going to be more compelling than the one that the witness attempted to tell. And the case that it started in was my very first trial. Um, It involved an allegation of indecent exposure, and the person who was alleged um, uh, to the defendant in the case was a lawyer. And he had a very, very good seasoned criminal defense lawyer representing him. Very good. He had a lot on the line because he was a lawyer. And the case was one in which he was accused, these were the facts of, he was driving in his car on the road, he was alone in his car, and there was a school bus that he was next to. And there were children on the school bus. And the story went, the story goes, that the children on the school bus began to all press themselves um, up against the one side of the school bus little hands and faces all pressed up against the the windows of the the sides of the school bus, one trying to clamor and get on top of the other, one pushing the shoulder of one, trying to create some some room, some vantage point to, to view. And the bus driver began to wonder why they were all on one side of the school bus. Of course, the bus driver is yelling, go sit down, what are you guys doing? And the kids are giggling and they're pointing. And then the bus driver looks in her mirror and she can see this man who's exposed himself. And so then she tries to slow the bus down to let the man go forward and pass. And um, as she slows down, the car slows down. And then she tried to speed up to, to get the kids away from the observation of this, um, of the man in the car. And as, as I recall the testimony, the car sped up. And so there was this, as she tried to slow down, the car slowed down. As she tried to speed up, the car sped up. And the kids were giggling. And then the woman, the driver, actually ended up claiming to see the man exposing himself and actually, um, Jerking himself off. Masturbating. That's what she said she saw. And of course she calls the police and the police end up pulling the man over. And they interview some of the students on the bus, but the parents don't want the students to be involved, which of course were some of the best witnesses we could have had. And at the time, I, as this was my first case now, and I... Um, was advised that we were not going to call any of the students. So we didn't have all of those emotional, sympathetic young kids who could come to court and testify to what they saw. So we had the bus driver. And when the police officer pulled the man over, he had um, um, found out that he was a lawyer and he had a story. Now, at some point later, I'll talk to you about the wisdom or lack thereof of people who encounter the police actually giving full detailed statements to the police. But despite his lawyer training, in which you would think he would know better, he chose to actually give a story to the police. And the story that he gave to the police at the time, as I recall it, was that he was applying some ointment to a rash. And I remember the case because I was sick. I was like Jordan game sick type sick. I was um, 
for those of you who've seen The Last Dance, you know that uh, he had food poisoning and had to play through it. And I showed up at court with throat lozenges and chloroseptic, uh, ibuprofen. I was doing everything I could to you know, Kleenex because I was so sick. And we went through this trial, and I remember I was, um, we were concerned because the story was is that he had been applying some kind of a ointment to a, a rash, to a condition that he had, and it was just inadvertent. Why would he want to jerk off or masturbate or expose himself in front of a busload of, of students of, was the, the defense. And part of me in that trial, I realized that part of the opportunity, part of my style was part of the necessary style, the best style the best approach was to prepare, but to be loose and to find the facts in that man's story that absolutely made no sense. And then to stick my finger, so to speak, into a little seam, create a hole, get my thumb and finger into the seam, maneuver to get the hole wider, get my hand in, and then push my hand apart, and then ultimately create enough room for both hands to be in and to tear the story apart. Which is exactly what I did. My boss at the time, I had two, my supervisor at the time was watching me try the case. I don't think he was at all prepared for how graphic I was with, the, with my examination of the witnesses. And my supervisor at the time, who was the head of the, the division in which I was in, I don't think he was even remotely prepared for how aggressive I was going to be. But I went through painstaking detail about the, the absurdity of claiming that the motion of applying ointment to like a, a jock itch, which would be on the inside of your thigh, could even be remotely construed or similar or misconstrued or understood and then I did it a, with my hand, a jerking off, masturbating motion in court. And I pointed out how lotion is applied and how lotion is applied to one particular spot and how it's gently applied and how it's applied only for a matter of seconds. And nobody would apply lotion while they're driving. You could just wait till you would pull over or you could wait till you get home. Or you could pull over to the side of the road, and why would you have to slow the car down and then speed it up to match the pace of the bus? There'd be no purpose unless one was going to argue that you were trying to, what, you were oblivious that a large, yellow-type bus was next to you? You're oblivious that there are kids peering in the window, almost giggling with hands, little hands and faces pressed up against the glass? And when I began to paint my picture, I began to paint my picture on cross-examination began to paint how absurd it was that the only reason for the car to be speeding up and slowing down with the pace of the car, with the bus, with the little faces pressed against the glass was because you wanted to be seen. And then when you went inside the car, of course, the absurdity is that you would take out some kind of a greasy lotion, um, a salve, if you will, and that you would put the salve on one small part you wouldn't be stroking the salve on your skin repeatedly, particularly not the part of you that is your, your Johnson and le, 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 your, your, as opposed to your inner thigh. My cross-examination was so killer that the judge in the case actually ended up writing a, a little limerick about it, as I recall. And I remember at the time that my supervisor had s suggested to me that um, he said, well, you're not shy, and I'm not. But I learned in that very first trial, and I began to apply in other trials as well, that if I took a step back and I thought about what really happened, that I could take any piece of any story, any piece of the story, any little piece of a story, 
And by looking at it from different ways that I, and looking at it and comparing it to what I believed to be the truth and what I knew to be the truth, that I had so many different tools at my disposal. And among those tools that I had at my disposal was humor. Among the tools I had at my disposal at times was sarcasm, although we don't use that very often. And among the tools, some of the, 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 the best tools were just the logic of my storytelling versus the story that the witness was telling. And out of that trial was born my style, which is a no-holds-barred, go-for-the-jugular, with a smile type of trial lawyering, which came to be known as killer cross-examination. And I've used it time and time again. So how do people, how do you develop your own style? How do you develop a style that's your own. You can certainly attempt to copy mine. You can borrow pieces of mine. You can attempt to learn from me and some of the tricks. But one of the first things is you have to be true to your own personality. I learned that in that case, that once the arguments were flowing and the witnesses were testifying and the cross-examination was underway, that I had to be true to myself. And I was. There's no doctor that's giving advice to a patient to apply a salve to the man's Johnson in a way that would even look at all like masturbation. No doctor would advise a patient to pull his or her penis out while driving and then to manipulate the cap of a salve and then to put it onto your, your Johnson and then to stroke while driving. It was absurd. At the time that we began to try the case, we were concerned because he was a lawyer and he had credibility and it appeared like, you know, they had some, produced some kind of prescription. But as I begin to think about it and I begin to put myself or attempt to put myself in those positions, I would think to myself, no doctor's doing that. No driver's doing that. And certainly not doing that, trying to match the pace of a bus. And so the killer cross-examination in that case out of that case, my approach to cross-examination was born. Through the coughs and the cough drops and the spraying my throat with chloroseptic and the constant blowing of my nose, I told you I was going to keep it real. The fact that at times I was sweating because I think I had a bit of a fever and at times I was chilly because I was cold. My adrenaline was flowing. But once I was in the moment, I was in the fucking moment. I was there. And the jury convicted. And when the jury heard that that was my first trial, they were stunned. Now, I've had good trials and bad trials. I've had good examinations and bad examinations. I've had good cross-examinations. I've had effective cross-examinations. And I've had some that were less than effective, maybe strident if not effective. But on that day, I realized what I could do by developing my own style. And I've been doing it ever since. So over the coming days, we're going to share some more war stories with you, but that case, that moment, that moment in time I remember I remember thinking to myself, I'm a killer. And I'm a killer with my words, with my logic. I'm a killer on cross-examination. <laughs>